Good morning. Glad to see y'all. Appreciate those online that are with us this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, Count Your Many Blessings. The text comes from uh, Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 through 9. The writer says, When I consider thy, thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hath crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then Psalms chapter 40 and verse 5. Many, O Lord, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God has made this world in which we live to be more than suitable for man's needs. In Genesis 1 and verse 31, the, the, after he's just created Eve, he saw all that he'd made, and he saw that, was, that it was not just merely good, but that it was very good. So we have all that we need. Everything that is necessary for our existence, for, for our benefit, our good, is here. And it, and it can be used, if we just use it correctly, it can be used properly for our benefit. As we look at this world, you know, you look at, you look at people that are very, very wealthy. Uh, and come by it honestly, we're not talking about thieves or anything. You wonder, well, why is it that some people are just so much better off than others? Well, we all have the same 24 hours. You know, somebody has a good idea and he exploits that idea. Nothing wrong with that. Proverbs chapter 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy, and thy want as an armed man. We can be productive or not so much. It's a matter of choice. We all have the same 24 hours. We can all get up and go to work. We can, choose to, we can just choose to do whatever we want to. We can select the field we want to go into. Uh, anything that is subject to personal power, that's something we can do. But some people aren't as successful as others. Some, you know, I, I don't like the idea of luck. Luck implies, or infers at any rate, implies that God is not in charge. I do believe there are some things that are random. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to point out the ones that are that way. But Christians know from whom our blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we praise him for them and the opportunity, opportunity to be blessed through them. James chapter 1, 16 through 18. All good things come down from the Father of lights. He is the one that blesses us with all of this stuff. You know, you, we, we, look at, we look at the weather that we have, especially the weather we've had in just the last couple of days. It's just been very, very destructive in some places. Up here, not so much. Had some tree limbs fall down and, and so forth. Uh, it gave us much needed water. Uh, some farmers didn't get to all of their beans. <laughs> I am guessing they will next week sometime, I hope. But you look at all these things and, and you just wonder what we're going to do with them all and all the blessings we have through it. But first of all, and again, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, it's the ones that I came up with in thinking about this lesson I, I, I would say if we all got together and started coming up with blessings to write on the chalkboard, we could write a whole bunch more. But this is what I came up with. So next week when you preach it, you come up with your own lesson. But we are blessed, first of all, through the physical world. I, I don't think there's any question about that or shouldn't be. Genesis 2 and verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. There is a... There is a, a, a a reason for our existence, and we're here for a purpose, and part of that is taking care of where we are. The earth contains riches and precious metals. Uh, turn your Bibles back to Genesis chapter 2. If, or if you want to, if not, just, just listen. Um, the, the thing is, is that the Bible tells us some information from which we can gain other information, 
In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, beginning, the Lord planted the garden, put man in it to take care of it. And in that garden were precious metals. Uh, you know, you could look down through the list there. Um, there is water there, verse 10. Uh, verse 12, there's bedel I have no idea what bedellium is, but they had it. There was onyx stone, the name of the second river is gone. So there was material uh, 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 resources there that, that could be taken, taken advantage of, that it was there for man's benefit. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pollution here in just a second when we come to it. Farming and cattle breeding came fairly soon in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 2. Uh, Cain was a, was a tiller of the ground and Abel was a keeper of sheep, uh, of cattle. Uh, so now, how did they know to do that? Um, I don't know. I can't say. I have my guesses. I'm sure God kind of prodded things along. I don't know if there's inspiration involved. I don't know how much trial and error was there, but, but they figured out how to plant things. They figured out how to raise animals and raise them to be healthy and to be useful because we have examples of these folks doing that. We find that man learned how to exploit the earth for gain. Now, oh, exploiting the earth is a bad thing. No, it's not either. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 19, we see some, uh, some examples of, of how man exploited and used. Um, ver, uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 20, and Ada bare uh, Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. Uh, verse 21, the last part of it says, handle the harp and the organ. So there were people that were becoming, that used resources and, and came up with instruments of music. How'd they know to do that? Again, I have no idea. Doesn't say, but they did it. Uh, if you look down to verse 22, and Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. He learned it and he taught folks. Again, how did he come up with that idea? By the way, you don't get brass. You don't go dig in a hillside and get out some brass ore. It's a mixture of things. How'd they know to do that? I don't know, but they figured it out. Brass and iron. Um, so, so we see that, you know, again, the implication is, is that the earth could be used. Um, and, and in talking about that, exploiting the earth. Uh, I'm, I would admit, suggest to you, I did a number of years back, I did a, uh, a lectureship manuscript on the Christian and the environment and got to studying about, uh, about pollution and stuff. And it is the case that you can't exist in your day-to-day -day life without creating pollution. You know, if you eat, you're going to create some pollution. You have to deal with it. When we were up in Kentucky, one of the men in the congregation he lived out, well, you couldn't go, you didn't have to go far to be out in the country in Kentucky. You just crossed the city line and you was in a wilderness. This man lived a few miles outside of town and he had an oil well on his ground. So I was out visiting him one day and he said, let's go look at it. Sure enough, we went out and looked. There's that thing going up and down, up and down, up and down. And I saw over here in the hillside that he'd, he'd cut out a pond. Wasn't a real, I, I don't think it would have taken up half of this, this room. I said, what's that? And he says, that's salt water. Okay. I knew what salt water is. I've lived on it for a number of years. Uh, where are you getting salt water? He says, well, it comes out of this, this well. And sure enough, the well is just like right over there. And pumping it out, and I noticed a pipe that would run from the well. And it had brine water. Now, when I say brine water, I don't mean stuff you put your pickles in. It would kill a dead pickle. That's just how. He said, taste it. Okay. <laughs> Some things you learn over years, just don't do it. So I reached to touch it. Man, I'm telling you, I am telling you, that stuff, uh, you wouldn't need much to salt your eggs. I'm, I'm telling you, just tipping your finger like that was enough to make your face get. It was strong stuff. It was pollution from a valuable asset. What do you do? He says, it just sits there and it eventually seeps back into the ground and it's absorbed and goes back to where it's supposed to go back to. But I, I can't just spread it out on the ground. It'll kill everything. Sure, it would have to. I absolutely would have. The point is, and, and when you dig for coal, when we lived up in, in um, Pennsylvania, my next door neighbor told me, he says, where we're standing right now, we're, taught, we're the fence that split the property, he says, where we're standing right now is a, is a mine tunnel, a coal mine tunnel, that if you had the map, you could make it to Pittsburgh, which is 45 miles away. 
a tunnel, a tunnel for coal that would go all the way to Pittsburgh if you had the map. I mean, you'd, otherwise you'd be there from now on. Whenever you dig in the earth, you're going to create some pollution. These farmers, have you noticed, have you noticed how brown and muddy the streams are? That, why is it? Because runoff. I guess if you built a wall around it, you'd keep it from happening. I, I think that'd be impractical. But the, and, and farmers, if they know what they're doing, take, take care of their fields because that's their livelihood. I'm simply saying that there's, there isn't anything. When you die, you create pollution. So what do we do? We have a responsibility to mitigate the effects of our existence. Adam was put in the Garden of Eden to do what? To dress and keep it. We, are, we have that same obligation. We have that same obligation today. Recycling, there's all kinds of things we can do. Just one of those things that, that is part of the parcel here that sometimes you don't think about. Advanced construction techniques were learned in Genesis chapter 11. It was after the flood and the people were spreading out over the earth. They got to the plain of Shinar and somebody said, hey, let's build ourselves a tower so that nobody will forget our existence. And they started making brick. Now, how did they learn to make brick? I have no idea. But somebody somewhere figured it out, and they are fixed to build a tower. And what little I know about it, your foundation, depending on how big you're going to build, you have to have a, an appropriate foundation to hold whatever it is you're going to build. Now, how'd they know to do that? I guess they, they, they died a bunch of times in building things and didn't build it right. And somebody figured it out. So we're blessed with the physical world. There's blessings and there's curses with it, but we can figure it out and, and mitigate all those things that go along with it. But, but as Buddy said in his prayer, that there, uh, when he was praying over the offering, the fact is that God has blessed us so that we can have uh, material wealth to give back to the Lord, a portion of that which he's given to us. There's nothing wrong with that. In the second place, we are blessed through our families. At, at least we can and should be. Um, we all, there's people that shouldn't get married, that shouldn't have children, or that should do a whole lot better than what they've been doing. But anyways, Genesis, uh, Genesis 2 and verse 24, God, God uh, put Adam and Eve together, and uh, they are to, to leave their father and their mother. Now Moses was edit writing an editorial note there in verse 24. Uh, we believe Moses wrote Genesis. I don't know who else would be able to write it. And he said that man shall leave father and mother and join together, and they shall be one flesh. And that's the way it ought to be. There's a, now, turn your Bibles to Matthew, or excuse me, to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 so you can follow along. In Ephesians 5 and verse 21, in a marital relationship, there is a mutual submission. Okay, the Holy Spirit says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, and so forth. Now, again, there's more to that. But there is first and foremost a mutual submission one to another because we're in this relationship together. And we owe, we have a, a, a I want to say a debt. I want to use the word debt. We have a debt one to another because of that relationship. Responsibilities might be even a better word. But there, it's a mutual thing. There's, we both have our roles, our appropriate roles. A husband and wife have appropriate roles in the marital relationship. Contextually, it says that the husband is the head of the wife and treats at least and treats her at least as well as he does himself. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, even as in the same manner in which, comparable to, Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Okay, now notice this right here. What did Jesus do for the church? He gave himself for it. He sacrificed himself for it. This is the model for a man that wants to be a husband after a godly sort. He is sacrificial for his wife, first of all. Now, if he's that way and she's got her head screwed on straight, how do you suppose she's going to respond to that? Okay, now we, now we go on. We're not done yet with fellas. Look down to verse 28 and 29. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, if you didn't understand the first sentence. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now we're assuming that the guy 
is fairly healthy in a mental and emotional way. That he's not a cripple in some form or fashion, and he, he, couldn't, he doesn't even treat himself right. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we have, under contemplation, a man that is willing to sacrifice himself for his wife and their, and their subsequent family, that he's going to be treating her at least as well as he treats himself, if not better, if he knows what he's doing. Now, when I've had discussions with even some of my high school classmates, and there's some very, very bitter people that have been married over the years and divorced a number of times, whew, man, and they start talking about their ex-spouses, whoo, buddy, man. My response to them is, is why would a Proverbs 31 woman marry somebody other than an Ephesians 5.25 guy? Why would, a, why would a Proverbs 31 woman marry somebody that is not at least an Ephesians 5.25 guy? Beyond me. Beyond me. But it happens all the time. Somewhere in there, somebody has to finally say, you know, maybe it's me and not them. Just saying. But the wife, then, is subject to her husband as unto Christ. Looking at verse 24. It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And I can hear the feminists all over the world saying, oh, oh, no, no, I'm not going not to submit myself to some man. Well, now, wait a minute. We're not talking about some man. We're not talking about some man. There's a whole bunch of men out there that are twits. I'm just saying. Mary of Ephesians 5.25, guy. That's what's under contemplation. Why wouldn't, a, if a woman submits herself to Christ and she finds a man that's willing to sacrifice for her as Christ did for the church, she'd not have very much insight if she wasn't willing to submit to him. Could you imagine that relationship? Here's an Ephesians 5.25 guy, marries a Proverbs 30, 31 woman, and they start that process of he's sacrificing for her and she's seeing what she does, what he's doing for her, and how much he's willing to sacrifice, how much harder is she going to work? And then if he's getting the benefits of sacrifice, how much more do you suppose that man's going to be willing to sacrifice? And she see that wheel, it's, 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 it's like a, my grandfather had an old John Deere tractor. Big, huge, of course I was only six years old, so it was really big. And it had that flywheel on the side. And he'd get up there and he'd, he'd pump a lever of some sort. He'd get down there and he'd take that fight. Well, boom, 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 boom. That thing would pop, 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 pop. So you twist that, that flywheel and you twist that fly. And you get that thing going and, it's, and that flywheel start, gets that motor going. And that flywheel is just going around, 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 around. And it keeps everything going. And it's in balance too, by the way. So here we have a husband and wife. That flywheel gets going. That motor starts up. And man, it's going to, just going to go and go and go. That's what we're looking for. That's what Paul is talking about here. Children are a blessing from God, are to be raised up in the Lord. Isaiah, Psalms chapter 127, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak, uh, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lord, obey your parents as they are teaching you about the Lord. Okay, there's a lot of parents don't teach you right. For this is right, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. My view, there's a lot of men that don't have respect for their children. That they treat their children like a stray dog. And I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just stunned at some of them. I've heard men say, well, I ain't changing no diaper. That's a woman's work. Well, shame on you. No, that's not to say I ever met a diaper I was glad to change. Don't misunderstand me there. But 3 o'clock in the morning, he squalled. I'd get up and wash him and wax him and bring him in the chair. Part of my job. That's what a man does for his children. You know, and it held the hands and held the foreheads as they were sick and things like that. 
And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. My job, we talked about this this morning, is to teach my children about God. Not just reading from the Bible. Um, 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 is it Deuteronomy? I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 5. No, it's not chapter 5. Where it says, raise them up uh, as you walk in the way, as you lay down at night. Okay, that's the passage. So in other words, I'm always teaching my children. I'm always coming up with a verse that applies to a situation. You know why this is what we ought to do, Justin? And I give the verse that shows it. You know why we shouldn't do that, Justin? And I give the verse that says why we shouldn't do that. How, what should we do, Daddy? Well, th well, the Lord says we should do this, and I quote the verse. Which implies I know what I'm talking about because I've read and studied the Bible. So as we go through that process, now somebody says, well, you know, again, we touched on this this morning. Our children are adults, and they, they get off tangent. Proverbs 22, 6. Well, I've, I've heard this quoted a lot. Well, when you train up a child in the way he should go, when he gets old and not depart from it. That's true if they've learned the lesson, if they took it to heart and applied it to themselves. It's a proverb, and it's true insofar as it goes. Well, it's true as far as it goes. What I'm, what I'm, the point that I'm making is, is that each individual is just exactly that, an individual soul. And they're going to choose what they're going to do. If they choose to follow what they were taught faithfully as a youth, then they will follow it all of their lives. And they won't depart from it. If they choose not to, if they're that wayside soil, if they're soils 2 and 3 of the Luke chapter 8, 11 through 15, what are you going to do? Pray, 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 pray hard, pray hard. That's about all you can do when they get away from home. That's about all you can do. In the third place, and again, there's, there's books written on that, on that whole topic there, so you know, obviously we're not going to cover it all. Thirdly, we are blessed through the labor of our hands. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. In other words, if you're going to do it, do it now, because you don't have tomorrow. We are to support ourselves. We have an obligation to support ourselves. Ephesians 4, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work that which, uh, let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. I support myself and those that are in need. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul says, I have showed you all things, talking to the Ephesian elders. How that so laboring, you ought to support the weak. In other words, I was doing that. And to remember the word, um, um, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He said, "It is more blessed to give than to receive." To the Thessalonian brethren, He said, um, "Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught." In other words, we didn't live off of you folks, but wrought with labor and travail night and day. I worked a side job. He was a tent maker, by the way, literally a tent maker, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. In other words, I had a job, and I made tents. That's how he came across Priscilla and Aquila, because they were tent makers also, the same trade. And he's out there working his craft and preaching the gospel in the meantime, building up the church there in Thessalonica. And then again, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, the brethren there in Thessalonica had a misunderstanding about when the Lord was going to come, and they apparently thought that he's fixing to come, well, just any day now, just any day now. So uh, I don't guess I have to go to work, do I? No, that's not what Paul taught at all. They misunderstood him. So he wrote the Second Thessalonian, Second Thessalonian letter and straightened them out. Now, in Second Thessalonians 3.10, Notice what he says there. He says, if any would not work, neither let him eat. Would not, not cannot, but would not. Well, I don't think I'm going to work today. You ain't getting paid. And don't come down here to church house looking for a sack of groceries. You get up and you go to work. Now, I'm talking about somebody that literally, this literally cannot work. I mean, that's, that's another issue too. But we are to see to the needs of our own families. 1 Timothy 5, verse 4 and 8. I am to see the needs of my, of my aunts, if I've got an elderly aunt. So that means I take care of my personal family, that take care, and I take care of my extended family, 
as I'm able to. And if I won't do that, Paul says in verse 8, I'm worse than an infidel. So I'm worse than a pagan. Because they at least apparently took care of their family. And you won't do at least what they do? Well, to what extent is that? I don't know. I guess you do whatever you can. I mean, you can't do more than what you're able to do. As I've said before, if all, all you have is a can of beans, I'll share you my can, share with you my can of beans. But if I, if I don't have um, steak, I can't share it with you. Okay. So you do what you can, and you, you know, if you have to take them into your house, and that's what you do. But we are to help the truly needy, Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. Now, we can't feed the whole world, but we can do what we can do. If all we can get is a, is a jar of peanut butter and a box of crackers to hand to people, then that's what we do. <laughs> By the way, we literally have peanut butter and crackers back there too, but I'm saying, and if we've got some beans and some other things, and if that's what we're able to do, then that's what we do. And um, as I've said before, the folks that were coming on a regular basis, I stopped giving to them when I realized they were just grocery shopping and not, not in need. And that was my own call. Um, we're also to care for the natural world, Genesis 2.15. I already touched on this briefly, but I want to touch on it again. Is we have an obligation to be, um, let's see, in Scouts, was to leave a, not even to leave a footprint kind of a thing. I forget exactly how that phrase goes, but when you went camping as a scout, when you left, you to clean up where you camped, clean up your fire ring and all, you pick up all your trash and, and make sure that uh, it was clean for the next person to come along, that you didn't cause any lasting damage to the where you were. And you were to fix what you could that you might have caused. So we're to care for the natural world. And finally, to live in a political environment, we are, we are blessed to live in a political environment in which we can freely exercise our God-given natural rights, privileges, and obligations. Not a lesson on politics, but my responsibility as a citizen of any realm that I live in. I do have obligations. We are to pray for government leaders. Paul, that's what, at least that's what Paul said, and you can take Paul at his word or not. Paul said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Who's left out of all? Well, nobody. So that's who we pray for. For kings, especially for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? There's a reason for those prayers that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let's say you're uh, a Chinese, uh, a, a person of Chinese descent, you're living in China under the current regime, Jing, Jing Xiaoping, I think his name is, the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, that are literally putting people that profess to be Christians in jail. They are burning down church buildings, now, I'm not just talking about the brethren, but I'm talking about those professing to be Christians at all. They are, they are at this particular point, they are actively suppressing the, those that are professing the Christian faith in a very, very literal and direct manner. What's my obligation? I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications for kings, for all that are 30, and so forth, because they are evil. And they are doing evil things. Whoever they might be doesn't lessen my obligation to pray for them. Uh, that's going to be hard to do. No question. No argument for me. And don't pray for thunder and lightning to fall on their parade. That's not it at all. Seriously, though. Our job is to pray for them that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Christians make the best citizens. But when you look, when you're in a, a regime like, like a totalitarian regime, all of them want to do away with religion. And I'll tell you why. Because you have a higher authority than the local government. Whether it's here in, in, in Sunflower County or whether it's down in Jackson or whether it's in Washington, D.C. You, you are submitting yourself ultimately as a Christian to a higher authority, and you don't recognize any level of government as superseding God. They don't like competition. You wonder why we're having to, why 
why you can't pray. Let one of your kids sit at the lunch, lunchroom table at lunch at school when they get back to school and open up their Bible and start reading their Bible. Let that, encourage your child to do that just so you'll find, well, grandchildren, just so you'll find out what's going to happen. Tell the kid what's going to happen. But somebody's going to come along and just jump all over that child. That's wrong. That's wrong. We are to behave as good citizens, Romans chapter 13. People in government bear the sword. Now, as God has defined and designed civil government, civil government is to protect the righteous from the unrighteous. That's their job. That's their job. Matter of fact, if you just look at it, that's their sole job, to protect, to protect the righteous from the unrighteous. Again, that's just what the Holy Spirit tells us. So you can read that for yourselves. Yet, we are to live as faithful Christians. Now notice two passages. Romans, excuse me, Acts 4 and verse 18 and 19. Now this is religious leaders, but they were, they, they were a theocracy. They, they ran the show. Now I, I grant you that they were, they were part of the Roman Empire, but the, the Jewish Sanhedrin pretty much ran Judah, as far as that goes. And they called them, the Sanhedrin, called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to God, judge ye. So they went, and went back into the temple and preaching Jesus and laying the blood at the feet of the, of the, the Jewish Sanhedrin. Hey, they went right back to work. Ephesians 5 verse 28. They got them together again. The Sanhedrin gathered the apostles again. Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah? What's your point? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And they, they got beaten half to death for it. Beaten pretty good for it at any rate. So the point is, is that we are to submit to civil government and all lawful authorities to the extent that we are able to within the ramifications of the law of Jesus Christ. Um, there's a movement that um, um, if certain folks came in here and wanted us, wanted me, wanted, wanted to use this building for their so-called marriage service, and wanted me to preach it. And if we didn't do it, we could liter literally lose this building. And we could all be fined. Now, you, you don't think so. A uh, guy's name is John MacArthur out in California. And I, I can't think of the name of the group. Grace something or other church. I, something like that. The state of California came in and said, you, you cannot have a church service, a worship assembly. You cannot sing. You cannot preach and teach. You can only have just literally just two or three people in your auditorium that seats over 300 or better than that. I think it's over 1,000 people. And he finally said, you know what? No, just no. And they told him we're starting to meet. Well, the this, this state of California is literally trying to put the man in jail. Um, I mentioned earlier about having your kids read their, open up a Bible in, at the dining room, at the table in the, in the dining hall, at the dining hall. In, in the cafeteria and read their Bible. They'd really get, they would literally get in trouble for it. They would literally get in trouble for it. Um, let, let a child that is valedictorian try to get up and in their, in their valedictorian speech talk about what Christ has meant to them in their lives. Whew. Well, you'd think gaps in the, in, the, in the earth opened up. It was trying to swallow people. There, there are young young people that have been, that have literally, one young person was suspended from school or something. I, I, I'm getting my facts mixed up, I'm sure. But a lot, a lot of pressure was brought to bear, and that child was not allowed to deliver that lesson, that, 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 that speech, because of religion. Listen, everybody has a religion. Everybody does. An atheist has a religion because an atheist has a system that tells him what's right and wrong that he lives by. But we as children of God have the blessing of God's word. And that's what I need to get back to. So we have these blessings. 
And there's responsibilities that go with them and obligations that go with them. But we have these blessings nonetheless. The most important blessing a man can possess is to be in Jesus when he passes from this plane of existence. When you breathe your last and your spirit departs your body, it behooves you to have been in Jesus prior to that moment in time. Revelation 14, 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed, happy are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they, might, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. In other words, being a faithful Christian. When we have worked the works of God, Romans, uh, John 6, 28, 29, we can have comfort in the thought of leaving here, having done our duty. Jesus in Luke 17, verse 10 says, We have done all those things commanded us say, we're unprofitable servants, we've done that which was our duty to do. In John 6, 28 and 29, the Jews that believed on him said, What must we do to work the works of God? And Jesus says, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. So if I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I am working. Not my work, it's the work that God has assigned me. God said, this is my work, that you believe on him whom he has sent. So, what, has, what are some other works that God has assigned for us to do? Well, he's assigned for us the job of hearing the gospel, John 6, 44 and 45. They should all be taught of God. To believe that Jesus is a Christ, John 8 and verse 24. That's a work. All of these are works that God has ordained that we should walk therein. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. God has commanded us to repent. Luke 13, verse 3, repent of our past sins. The Lord has ordered us, has assigned us the work of confessing Jesus as Lord. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, in a public way. We've also been commanded to be immersed as a work. Mark 16, 16, that God has ordained for us to do. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and to live faithfully. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give unto thee the crown of life. It is a work. These are a series of works assigned to us by God that we should walk therein. But when we've done all of that, we don't deserve anything. We haven't earned anything. Whatever we receive from doing the works that God has ordained, that we should walk therein, we receive because of his grace. For by grace he is saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Ephesians 2, verse 8. It's all by the grace of God. But God only saves those that obey him. Hebrews 5, verse 9. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey him. All of those that do the work that is our duty to do, that God has assigned for us. Luke, uh, Luke chapter 17, and verse 10. If you're not a child of God, become one. To be able to have the blessing, to begin to possess the blessings that God has for us. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. He has given us so much and there's no way. He's, by the way, he's given us to ourselves. He's given us to ourselves. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, the Spirit's going to return back to God that gave it. And he's told us to occupy till he comes. In other words, I want a return on my investment. I want you to take the blessings that I, uh, of you that I've given to you, and I want you to return it of more value when I come for it. So, if you're not a child of God, become one. Begin the valuable process of, of creating value in yourself. Be the child of God that God wants you to be. If you, if you have started that process, but for some reason you've fallen by the wayside, let's restart you. Let's get you back on the path. Ask God's forgiveness and repent of your sin. If you need prayer, if you need Bible study, that's what we're here for. But we invite you to come all together we stand and sing.